Hey everybody, Chris here on a special Tuesday live. Super exciting. I've got Ellie Gano, co-founder and CEO of Booty Bag. Ellie, thanks so much for being on today. Co-founder, only founder. Oh yeah, did I say co-founder? I'm still used to saying that about myself. This is awesome because Ellie's jumping on right now with us. She was just on Shark Tank on Friday, made a deal with one of the sharks. How exciting, Ellie. How exciting is this to be? Yeah, with a deal yeah. And it feels like... It feels like your funeral and you're like living through it. Everyone's like reaching out and being so supportive. It's the best like cloud nine feeling. Um, but yeah, it's been nothing but upside. So it's been a cool experience, very nerve wracking, but um, yeah, grateful to have been a part of it. I mean, I love seeing it because we met, I think in 2017 at our event and you've spoken at Sub Summit and you've built this amazing business. So I've seen you grow a ton and uh, you built an amazing community with your brand. And, and I know that it says you started this with like $300 and have done over 15 million in revenue over the last four years. Like, I mean, Juan, congratulations. So like amazing job in being an innovator in the subscription space, amazing job building this brand from nothing. And then you made a deal with uh, somebody that you idolize, Kendra Scott, right? Yeah. So let's, let's yeah. talk about. Fangirl for her. You fangirl, right? You said, so oh let's talk God. about you know getting on the show what that was like the process because i mean that's a dream for a lot of people right? yeah yeah let's we'll talk a little bit about that getting on the show and how that went yeah it's interesting because like COVID hit i was obviously like everyone else like just watching shark tank religiously like every season i probably watched all of them and they're like sitting on the couch with a glass of wine and i was like fuck I'm going to apply for this. <laughs> Why not? What's the worst thing that could happen? Right. And so I like, filled out the form. I didn't tell anyone. And like a week later, I got a call. And this woman is like, hey, congratulations. Like you are picked to uh, do the application process for Shark Tank. And I go, shut up. No chance. <laughs> she, I was yeah. like, are you sure? And I like did not believe her. So I had her hang up, email me from her Shark Tank email address because she wanted to know like, all of this information. Yeah. And I was like, no, you don't get it. I never win anything. No one picks me. Like I was always the last in line. Like there's no chance that Shark Tank is calling me right now. Yeah. I was like, no. My like left, they like take my social and like run. So <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not picking any information. So she um, ended up like verifying that she was with Shark Tank and I called her back. I'm so sorry. Like I'm so excited. Um, but the process was like so grueling. I mean, it's long, right? Like there's a lot of like applications and like video and recording and just because of like COVID as well, like there was just different like hoops to jump through, like virtually you were stuck in a hotel for like two weeks. Or yeah. Something, right? yeah. Yeah, exactly. 14 <laughs> days. I can't um, believe it. They bring you food. I mean, they were so good about being like COVID conscious, which was awesome. And like they had to do that in order to do the show. So yeah, it was just like it was just wild, right? So um so fun, but it was yeah, quite well, quite when the did you apply originally? Six months ago. So oh. right when COVID hit. So like that, like same, like within the first two weeks. Tons of paperwork. You had to send in a yeah. video, right? Like a three minute so video. Many videos. Yeah. So. What did you send in your first video? Tell us about like what you think. I mean, look, you got a great personality. You built a great brand, but like, what do you think? Would you give advice for other people trying to get on the show? What, what, what was good about your video? You think that worked well? The video, yeah. The advice I would give is like, and you know, I kind of go back to this even with like our community and like how I built our social media channel is like authenticity. Like I genuinely got on there, and like maybe the first version was too authentic, but like. You know, like you kind of just have to show your personality and not edit it to like the facade of perfection, which I think they're just looking for real people um, and they want to connect with you. Right. And I think that's what makes for a good TV show and for a good social media page and just like trying to figure out how you can get your story across without it being like I had to let go of like that. OK, I hate the way I look. I hate the way I sound. I hate my backdrop. And just be like, fuck it. Like, this is me. This is my story. And you like it or you don't. I think what I love about what you've done is a lot of times you see on uh, Shark Tank, it's a business that's like, if they don't get a deal with the sharks, they're going to go yeah. out of business. Like, they need something. Where in your case, you're building a profitable business. And you've done yeah. it from nothing. Um, how did they react to that? Were they more interested? Because, like, you're running in profitability. 
Yeah. Like, tell us a little bit about that and the reaction. It's like dating, right? Like you never want to be like desperate. I like have to compare it to that. Or if you are desperate, you just pretend like you're not desperate. But I mean, they can they can feed feed off of you just because of your energy around that. I think and just being strong and just knowing like, hey, I'm presenting. You know, I don't need this. I don't need you. Like this would just be a mutually good partnership. Is definitely even if it's not true. I think the confidence behind that is is stronger. So crazy. And I know that you even got an offer from Mr. Wonderful, which is like so hard to get, right? Which is so awesome. It's so um, funny. He's like know? generally such a like a hard character. And I don't know if they just like paint him out to be like Simon Cowell because they need a bad guy. I'm not sure, but he's like so nice. I need like a little meme actually, because after the episode like cut, he was like, I I want some booty. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was like no booty for you. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah girl. <laughs> um, and they, you were you pitched for how long? But they showed what maybe ten minutes or eight minutes. Or how yeah, long did you pitch for? Yeah, it was um like a fifty minute pitch, and they cut about like I think the episode's like fifteen minutes. So it's yeah. yeah. And when did you kind of know during the pitch that like okay this is. Because three of them wanted it, like from what I yeah. saw, they wanted it, right? You had, um, you had, you had your girls Kendra, then you had Miss Wonderful, then you had uh, Barbara. The, Barbara, right? They all. When did you kind of know, like, because that was th they only had four sharks on that one, right? So uh, Mark Cuban and Lori were there as well. Oh, they were okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I think Mark Cuban, I have like I have actual crush on. So I was like, <laughs> I was <so> nervous. <laughs> I was like, couldn't make eye contact. So I was like, I love you. Oh my god, it's great. <laughs> And when did you realize, like, okay, they're interested? I mean, they probably heard your numbers and, like, but what else? Yeah, it was, like, relatively shortly after the numbers. Um, Kendra just, like, looked at me and was, like, I love you. <laughs> and, I, and at that moment, I was, like, cool, let's play, you know? Like, I, I mean, it wasn't as intimidating as I feel, like, even pitching at, like, I, I was more, more nervous pitching at SEPTA. I mean, that was also my first time ever yeah. um, talking in public. But, like, I was more nervous to do that than – shark tank because it's actually a pretty like comfortable um vibe in there you're not like you're mic'd up for tv reasons but you're talking to them and they're close enough to talk to you so you're not using a mic to talk to them so you kind of are like really vibing and reading the room and like you feel like you can't touch them obviously but you're close enough in that vicinity so it's not as intimidating as like when you walk in and like do a pitch or you know you're in front of a crowd so, so yeah, I felt pretty comfortable once I got through like my recited, you know, pitch. Yeah. Well, I think you got a good personality. Like it makes, I, I feel like it's natural for you and you're probably more critical on yourself than you Oh should. my God. I mean, you know, it's just nerve wracking knowing like yeah. I went in there and I was like, N the potential of nothing coming out of my mouth is hot. Like, that, and I was like, yeah. and I know they won't air it if nothing comes out. So I was like, yeah. if nothing comes out. I'm just going to walk away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, I'll just leave it there. So like I went in like low expectations, <laughs> although I did put in a lot of time prepping, but I was like, you know, this is like, this is out of your comfort zone. You just got to go for it. Tell me about how awesome it was for you. And then surprising that Kendra Scott was there and this backstory you were telling me about how she's somebody you looked up to in the past. Yeah, so I am super involved with like Create and Cultivate, which is a women's like conference empowerment. Um, four years ago, like when I started the brand around the same time, I had just kind of kicked off. <clears throat> I probably had a few um, big inventory issues and some things that had happened to me that I didn't have a network of people. And so that's why I was going to this conference and building and trying to like gather as much information as possible. So I was like, there has to be more content out there around failure. And I sat in the back of this panel with Rebecca Minkoff and um, Kendra Scott, and they got up there and it was before, you know, I think there's a lot of podcasts out and a lot of like founder stories <clears throat> that share like the raw authentic version. But like four and a half years ago, there wasn't even like influencers out. So like there really wasn't that like, authenticity access that you could get unless it was like an online you know bio or whatever like there just wasn't as much content around this and so i sat in the back and i had listened to all these like um amazing women speak but nothing like just more about building brands whatever they came on and they were like 
this shit's fucking hard. Like, you want to know how we did it? Like, we bootstrapped, we did, we brought our kids in. Like, we tried everything, we failed, we did this. Like, this is my fourth business idea. Like, it's okay to fail. And I was like in the back going, it's not just me because I am dying over here. Like, (laughs) I was like, this is hard. And it was like the first story that I heard that I was like, I can relate to this. I get it. Like, everyone's kind of just in the trenches maneuvering and it's okay like it's totally okay to not know what you're doing and so i left and i was like damn that changed my entire life and i went out to see rebecca minkoff she just started her own like female founders i like went flew out to new york and i was like i have to tell you you changed my life like i just i'm here to support you this is amazing i love what you do like thank you for like that you know panel um, and so I'm 14 days of quarantine and I get a call from the producer and they're like, so you're on a guest shark series. Guest shark is Kendra Scott. That's crazy. And I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> I love her. And I was like, oh my God, is this worse? Because now I'm going to be like fangirling while trying to pitch yeah. and being like, I love you, but I'm here. You're going to have your money. <laughs> like, yeah. Can I hug? Like, what can we do? Yeah. yeah. So I was like, so damn stoked already and then to like have kendra i was like this is and that's who you wanted right at the end of the day you yeah i mean as soon as i knew i was like i'm here for kendra it was meant to be really yeah hard. yeah i feel now, like that's kind of like my theme with business is like anytime something's supposed to be like extremely obvious for me to do it's been like kind of like this yeah. is the now, i think what's important for people watching is it's great to get on the show, but you did a lot of things over the last four years that got you to this point. And you started with, they said $300, like basically nothing. And you've yeah. been scrappy. Let's talk about this journey. Like, I know that you were really big and you built an amazing community. I'm big on community. I think 2021 is the year of community, right? Especially yeah. everything's happened with COVID. But a brand that can build a community is building a successful business. What are things that you think you've done really well? Or how did you do things that help you really build that community? Yeah, it's interesting because I think it's it's changed, right? The landscape is so different now from like where it was when I first started off. I mean, it was as simple, and I hate to say this, but it was as simple as like giving free product in exchange for content. Like that's not the game anymore. I mean, you can do it, but it's right. it's so different, right? You have to pay to play, and it's it's a different field. But I think what I go back to, and I think why our community is so strong, is because not like the authenticity. I mean, we don't edit our photos. We try to engage the audience as much as possible, whether that's them producing the content for us and like getting their friends to, you know, tag each other and participate. And like, we're making it about them and it's not really about us in our direction of the brand. We're allowing them to kind of tell us and cater us into like what they want and just building it around them to support them, which I think has been huge versus like, I, I would say like I came to it with a product and then allowed their feedback in real time to generate like how I produced the product, what kind of content I was producing. Like we're constantly surveying, like the brand is essentially like for them. Right. And how important was it like when people posted or commented like your team responding and like even you responding to these posts? Yeah. How so important I- was that? And up until COVID, um, I actually was on like, I mean, with my team who does a lot of the heavy lifting, but like every comment, reading every DM, like everything um, up until like we had 156,000 followers because, and I, I do believe this still, it's uh, the only tr- like telling truth source of like what they want to see, all the like, like you just know, like you know exactly how they feel about the product every month. And the reason I like kind of stopped was because with COVID, I just felt like it was so, um, it was so, it was such a sad place in the world right then that there was like a lot of negative commentary going on. And um, it was hard. It was hard to then kind of like separate that from the business and personal. So I took a little bit of a step back from it, but I still weekly, you know, daily will check it and, and check in and see how everything's going. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so critical because you're connecting with the consumers that are following your brand. And that yeah. just increases that 
that loyalty to what you're doing, right? You're not the only underwear subscription, but you've built an amazing brand that's got this community. So they're so loyal to you. Yeah. And I think I remember you telling me like, sometimes you'll post like a pair on Instagram and like sell out. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's our, it's our, like, it's our bread and butter. I mean, that's how we ha like, not only from like product, you know, what products we want to expand into to how they like the month's bag, but then we also use it for, you know, a pulse of like, how is this month gonna sell? So we can like plan accordingly. Yeah, I love it. I think it's great what you've done. Um, I know one thing that you like to talk about are things not to do for these entrepreneurs. <laughs> Favorite. And, um, you know, there's so many aspiring entrepreneurs that are trying to build amazing subscription brands. As you know, I'm trying to help them as much as possible. Um, and I'm grateful to have you on to give some advice because you've done an amazing job building a business. Give me your top three tips you'd give to a new entrepreneur on things they should not do. And I put you on the spot. Everybody yeah, wants. you're on the spot. I don't like yeah. that. No, it's all good. Um, I mean, I, I have like some things that just automatically jump out to me. I, and I'm probably going to say this a little bad, so we'll just work through this, but <laughs> not consultants. I don't have a thing against consultants, but I do feel like as an early entrepreneur, I was I took a lot of bad offers, not like consultant deals. I don't want to say consultants in general. Yeah. I want to like get them, but like anybody that seems too eager to help you, yeah. I would double check their resources, yeah. <laughs> like references. Yeah. And I don't know like if you're getting the vibe there, but. No, no, for I sure. Because like you want people that have walked the walk. Now, I mean, I did help you for a little bit, so I hope you got some. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. I'm like referring to you, no. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but but you're right. You want people that are like this is a different game subscription. This isn't this isn't typically commerce. So I get where you're coming from. You know, the people that are going to potentially help you, they need to understand retention. They need to understand customer loyalty, building relationships. So I know what you're getting at. It's it's one tip is making sure that if you're going to hire somebody to work with you, that they know what they're doing. They've got some right or check re re references. Reports. Yeah. Yeah. References. It's like, I would just, I would label it as that. Like, make sure you do your homework, just like a hire. Um, people interview really well, which I think is interesting. So you, you have to weed through a lot of bullshit. And just because they have a better, like, you know, resume or more qualifications than you doesn't mean that they know your business better. And I think that was like huge for me because I just kind of was like a puppy dog, like, help me, help me, help me, like, tell me what to do instead of being like, no, my gut knows, like, this is not the right decision. Let's like work through it and, and know what your strengths are and playing those versus allowing people to kind of tell me like, this is what you have to do to have a successful business. Well, I think now too, though, there's so many, there's so many free resources out there too, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, totally. I, and it works for plugging in Subtub, but I mean, we've got all these free resources I and mean, you don't have to pay anything and you get all this yeah. free stuff, right? And you guys have the, yeah. And you guys have the membership too, right? For Slack. Yeah, I mean, membership, yeah. yeah, but there's a free one. But I think too is just like having experts like you on. I mean, there's a ton of things that people are going to get out of this conversation that was free, right? Hopefully, yeah. Um, but that makes sense. All right, what's your next tip? Yeah, I mean, kind of goes into like the same thing. I think um, allowing yourself to be like vulnerable and share share um, the hard conversations is interesting because I was in the beginning and still now. There's a lot of things that I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm going through like, you know, raising money and pitching and everything's a new journey. And it's so humbling and embarrassing to say like, listen, I, I don't know what I don't know, but I need someone to help me. But I also need to like check the resource, you know, references and like yep. you're just weeding through a lot of things at the same time. But allowing yourself to be vulnerable and to show those things and to talk to other entrepreneurs is huge. I mean, that's a big re resource that I've used personally is like going to somebody else either on LinkedIn or through a connection and being like, Hey, like I see that you've built X. I'm curious of how you like solve this problem. Can you help me? And being really strategic on how you're asking, I feel like entrepreneurs are so helpful um, and they've been in the trenches and they know how shitty it can be. And so if they could help you, you know, not make the same mistakes that they did, at least this is how I feel. I would love to spend, you know, 30 an hour with you and be like, cool. Here's how I got through it. I can't guarantee it will work, but it, maybe you'll avoid some mistakes. So I think like tapping your network is a huge like step number two. And and or if you don't have a network, that's okay. Like ask people for help. Yeah. I think you bring up a good point. This goes back to being self-aware, right? So as entrepreneurs, 
you got to be self-aware of what you might not be that good at. And it's okay to yeah. ask, right? I always say God gave you two ears and one mouth so you can listen twice as much as you talk. I like that. Um, and it's important. I mean, I can remember days, you know, four or five years ago, I'm sitting in a room with like these founders of businesses that are worth like 500 million and a million. And they're talking in a language where I was like literally at dinner, like under the table, Googling what they were saying. Yeah. I, was like, I don't want to look like an idiot here. Right. But I didn't say a word. And right. it's now I can go into that same dinner and they're listening to me. Yeah. I think it's important to recognize what you don't know so that you can ask, just like you said, it, well, entrepreneurs are so great and they're so willing to help for free. I love nothing more than like giving advice to people. But yeah. I also can recognize when like somebody's done a really amazing thing that I need to ask the questions. I think entrepreneurs, yeah. any entrepreneur that thinks he knows everything or she knows everything is like, they're like really sort of delusional, right? Like you don't right. know everything and there's somebody's right. always going to be able to help you. So that's great advice. And I think you're right. Shouldn't people messages on LinkedIn? I mean, people are happy to help and there's still totally. great knowledge out there. There's um, so well, and Chris, is like, that's kind of like my point is like, I would sit at those things and I would be like, oh, I'm so stupid. I don't know any of this. I'm not going to ask what CAC is. And so now I'm like, fucking, what is that? Tell me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ask, right. Okay. It, it doesn't matter yeah. what anybody it thinks. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And like people with big, large companies still need to ask stupid questions. And like, I just genuinely like feel like now I can show up and be like, can you break that down for me? Because I don't understand. And like, I that's okay. Listen, I about a year and a half ago, I was having dinner with somebody in the subscription space. They have over 100,000 subscribers, building an amazing business. I asked him what his LTV was, and he didn't know. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, and okay. I, looked at, I looked at him, and I was like, look, like, I love you. You're my friend. Don't send me another text message or email until you give me that number. But it was so important, right? And, and, and it was okay. And, and, and I was wanted to help. Right. And I think right, it was, right. it wasn't a matter of being embarrassed. Um, it was just a key point, but let's go into another part, which I think I know that you had to deal with this. I've had to deal with this and so many entrepreneurs had to deal with this and this is inventory management. Let's talk about that. I <laughs> No, actually, because I'm <laughs> Are you kidding me? I am the opposite of how to manage your inventory. By the way. <laughs> but, yeah, but you learned some things. So let's talk about the things, some mistakes you made and how you adjust it. Cause it's such a critical yeah. thing to know. Yeah, well, I think this goes into like my step. And we got a little heart there. We just got a heart on that comment. So people want to know. <laughs> it's an inventory planner going like, yeah, she's <laughs> Well, no, I think step number three is interesting or step number three, whatever, tip three or your, my advice three is like hire, know what your blind spots are and hire them. Like yeah. you are only as good as your team, period. Yeah. And like, I know what I don't know. I know what I'm not good at. And I'm like, get in here, sister, like help me out. Yeah. Um, you're the expert. I need you to do this. I absolutely, I mean, I almost failed my business probably twice because I bought too much inventory, like straight up was like, it's a big cash, cash, right? yeah. and I go to my warehouse. I'm like, Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that fucking sucks. Yeah. What, what was my question? How did it not? How to, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, or like it's okay to sell out, right? Like thinking about oh, yeah. not being okay. sold, so like right now, yeah, like, like, yeah, how have you solved that and made it so that you don't have so much extra inventory and, and all that? Realized that that was never going to be my strong suit. Yeah, I hired, um, brought somebody in just specifically to monitor inventory, which we have a pretty unique model. It's like we bring in new styles every month, so it's not necessarily like one skew, you're always constantly buying and then your predictive buying, which it's a, it's a mess. It's a full-time job. So um, hired appropriately. And then, you know, as a bootstrap company, we just decided internally that like selling out is our best game plan yeah. and satisfying the customers that we have as members and allowing them to have all the perks that we offer was more true to our brand culture than, you know, taking those away and allowing to potentially sell more. Um, so we honor kind of like the members first and then we open it up to new members and we sell out, we miss out on sales, which is kind of happening with Shark Tank, but our margins are better. I'm not that aggressive of a person when it comes to sales. I like to like, I'd rather now because of my inventory mistakes be like, we had a really good month, not I have to chase inventory and I have to make these sales. 
because otherwise we didn't hit our numbers. Yeah. Like that to me is like so stressful. Um, yeah. And it just doesn't work if you're bootstrapping and you have to hit your goals. So I for us- can build some demand too, right? Because it's sold out. Now people want to get on a list. They want to make sure they're on yeah. the next month. I think it's probably really important to look at data, to know what your months where things increase, look at how you're growing by month by month and picking yeah. the right amount of inventory to buy and not, I think as entrepreneurs, especially when we're young, we reach, we're like, oh, we can sell 10,000 this month. And it's like, yeah. no, you really can't. Well, like, you have no percept, like mine, like I don't think I had a perception idea of what 30,000 pairs of underwear really looks like. Yeah, yeah. You know? Until I saw it and I was like, that's a lot of boxes. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> amazing. But look, you figured it out and I think, like you said, you almost went out of business twice. I mean, because it holds up cash. Oh, yeah. so it's very important that as an entrepreneur, you're conscious of your inventory. It's okay to sell out and just look at the data and just yeah. make better decisions for the future. I also think like kind of off of that, I think there's like a cockiness that comes when you start like getting sales and getting like mm -hmm. a little bit of cash. Like for me, I was like, oh, I, I need this. I need this. And I lost like that scrappy hustler mentality when I yeah. first started. Cause I had some access cash. And so once you had that, I was like a little bit more like spreading it all around. And that like put me right back into like, Oh no, humility. Let's go back yeah. there. <laughs> What's the basics. I mean, COVID actually, too, you know, so glad you said that because that's a big, big issue with entrepreneurs is they make a bunch of money in a year instead of, or they have a good year or have a good month. Yeah. Instead of reinvesting in the business, hiring another person that's going to pay dividends, they go buy a $40,000 watch because they want to impress somebody. And I always joke, and this is something that somebody that I look up to, Gary Vee always says is, you know, you're buying this watch that you don't even really want to impress people you don't even really like. And, yeah. and that's the truth. And and we all go through that stage. But yeah. Pick, you know, play the long game. I mean, this is an infinite game. I mean, there's so much time and you've got years to build this amazing business. So reinvest it into what you're building. Yeah. I meant more of like I was buying like more inventory and like oh, software. Yeah, okay, but they go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. But, but it's but, but also yeah. a thing with these entrepreneurs is they do it and they go buy a new car or they like, right? right. And like right. they shouldn't be doing that. In your case, yeah, you're buying more inventory that you maybe didn't need. Um, right. Right, but it's right. still spending money not wisely, right? And totally. Just not using yeah. the right thing. Go back to the basics for sure. Yeah, no, I love it. And you did it. With three hundred dollars, yeah. I actually funny backstory is I asked my like best friend for the three hundred dollars originally, no and she and I was like, I'll give you half. Which you know, I mean, we were obviously I didn't know how to run a business, but I was like, I'll give you half, half of my company that it hasn't started yet. But if you give me three hundred dollars, and she looked at me and she was like, Where are you gonna get the underwear? And I was like, I don't know. She's like, No, I'm not giving you three hundred dollars. That's stupid. <laughs> And so now we always laugh because I'm like, remember, I was going to give you half a booty oh bag. God, if you called me, I would have given you 500. <laughs> Just, <laughs> what a great story. What a great story. Also, I wanted to point, look what someone just commented here. And I just want to show this to everybody. Riding um, this, riding my 2008 Kia until the wheels fall off. Love it. Yep. Dude, dude, keep rolling it. I love that. And everybody watching, it just, it's it's good model to, to think by. Um Ellie, this is awesome. I want to first thank you. This is short notice for everybody watching. This is actually supposed to be a pre-recorded podcast for YouTube, but I was like, you know what? You were just on TV. This is hot. We got to go live. You were such a trooper and a uh, great friend that jumped on. And so I want to thank you for all your support to SUPTA. Thanks for being a good friend, coming to all the events. I know that if anybody wants to see you, you'll be in Dallas next year for the live event. 